The world of transnational sustainable development is a world where words mean pretty much the opposite of what they seem to mean. So we've organized this panel in order to explore this, to introduce my fellow panelists. Michael Shaw will make the lead presentation. He is president of Freedom 21 Santa Cruz, one of the country's uh, premier organizations that is attempting to expose the sustainable development agenda, its connection to uh, a United Nations document called Agenda 21. There's a copy of it right here. And he also, the big one, yes. It, it's, a, it's a big thing. Is that small for a UN document? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it may have expanded in the intervening years since I, since I printed that. He also owns Liberty Garden, which is a land management operation devoted to the idea that proper thinking about about environment and land management begins with private property rights, an idea that I know Austrian scholars are going to endorse. He'll present a paper entitled The Nature of Sustainable Development, the Transformation of America's Systems of Government, Justice, and Economics. And next to him and on my immediate right is Mr. Henry Lamb, who among us has the distinction of having been honored specifically in a statement by Dr. Ron Paul that was entered into the congressional record on July 11, 2005 as a great freedom fighter. Uh, Henry's the executive vice president of the Environmental Conservation Organization. Here, I got that right. <laughs> devoted, among other things, to revealing how much land in the U.S. is being grabbed by the U.N. His evidence was assembled through his having attended um, numerous U.N. meetings <coughs> where he drew the connection to sustainable development and saw that that was the dominant theme uh, being discussed there. Henry's work also involves years of working with or on the land, and he also promotes private property rights as a necessary condition for good stewardship. He will present a paper entitled Agenda 21 and the United Nations. Then I will follow. You all know me, so I won't say so much about myself, but I will present a paper entitled Par Public-Private Partnerships and the Destruction of Free Enterprise. Now, one final note. Originally, we had scheduled an additional panelist, Dr. Madeline Cosman, who was going to present on sustainable medicine. But Dr. Cosman sadly passed away just a few weeks ago from a sudden, very serious illness. She'll be missed. This session is dedicated to her memory. Michael Shaw. America is being swamped with a cost, costly policy program that has infiltrated every county in the country. The program is centered squarely upon the effort to eliminate private property. It is swarming the country under the warm and fuzzy term sustainable development. Sustainable development is the popularized expression for Agenda 21. Agenda 21 is the 1992 Rio Conference Declaration on Environment and Development. Agenda 21 is, quote, the comprehensive plan of action to be taken globally, nationally, and locally by organizations of the United Nations systems, governments, and major groups in every area in which human activity impacts on the environment. My goal in the next few minutes is to describe the origin, the implementation, and the general nature of sustainable development, Agenda 21, and to illustrate how this global comprehensive plan 
is setting about to transform American systems of government, justice, and economics. I became acquainted with Agenda 21 in the mid-90s when, because of my work on land management activities, I found myself attending the local Santa Cruz County Agenda 21 program. After attending this, I came back to those people I associated with and I said, don't worry about it. This is crazy ideas proposed by bizarre people. <laughs> Notions that Mother Earth couldn't be scratched and were, were being proposed, that all water needed to be uh, centrally controlled, and that no human being should use more than 10 gallons of water per day. But it wasn't until 2001 when I found that our Board of Supervisors had quietly and unanimously adopted the provisions of Agenda 21 in 1997. Agenda 21 is identified for Sustainable Community Action Plan, our agenda for the 21st century. Oftentimes, and in most counties, you won't see the term Agenda 21 because other clever, warm and fuzzy titles have been prepared for it. There's a man named J. Gary Lawrence who was an advisor to the President's Council on Sustainable Development. He's the director of the Center for Sustainable Communities at the University of Washington, and he's a chief planner for the city of Seattle. And when attending a UN meeting in 1998 in England, he said, quote, Participating in a UN advocated planning process would very likely bring out many who would actively oppose and defeat any elected official undertaking local Agenda 21. Well, that's certainly true. So we call our processes something else, such as comprehensive planning used in the state of Wisconsin, growth management used in the state of Oregon, or smart growth as we have in California. Today, terms like visioning, common, 2020 or plain community plan are the terms that are often used. It is said always in every county that it's a locally driven program, but comparisons between counties across the country show remarkable similarities which evidence a top-down system that conforms to Agenda 21's comprehensive blueprint. Sustainable development, like all movements, has a symbol. The symbol they use are three connected circles. Many Congress people show these three connected circles on their web page. Our congressman, Sam Farr, on the central coast of California, makes it the centerpiece of all communications that he engages in. The three circles represent one of three E's. Those three E's are equity, which is designed to use the law to re-engineer society. Social justice and environmental justice are the key coin words of, uh, of the equity side of Agenda 21. The precautionary principle sits at the course, cornerstone of the equity concept under Agenda 21. The precautionary principle is the notion that no person can take an action that may cause harm. In Santa Cruz, when the Department of Interior came in to adopt a countywide habitat conservation plan to protect over 114 species of bugs, plants, and animals, the rule for the long-toed salamander was that you couldn't walk on your land during its mating season because you might step on it and you couldn't prove that you hadn't stepped on it. The, the second E is economy. And by economy, sustainable developer means the restructure of American economy so to cause an international redistribution of our wealth and to replace free enterprise with what they call public-private partnerships. You say, well, look, America's not going to accept such a crazy idea. You were right in 1995 when you said, this is too nutty to ever proceed. But it's amazing what they've been able to do when they cloak these two E's with the third one. <coughs> the environmental movement, which clearly means nothing more than putting nature above man. At the same Earth Summit in 1992, this document was also produced in addition to Agenda 21, the Global Biodiversity Assessment Report. 
That's what tells us what sustainability is and what is not sustainable. I'll come back to that. There has been plenty of United States government support for Agenda 21, sustainable development. In 1992, George Bush Sr. was there in Rio and was the signatory for the United States for the administrative implementation of that program in this country. In 1993, President Clinton, by executive order, created the President's Council on Sustainable Development. Very few business interests were involved. California's PG&E chairman of the board was there, and so was Ron Lay of Enron. Otherwise, it was comprised of uh, NGO and environmental group organizations. In 1997, the counties and mayors created the Joint Center for Sustainable Communities. And there is no community in this country that is not follow, following the policies that, to bring sustainability into their community. In 2001, the National Governors Association endorsed unanimously the policies of smart growth. The sustainable goal is the elimination of the middle class. Marie Strong, a Canadian oil millionaire, was the Secretary General to the United Nations 1992 Conference on the Environment and Development, where Agenda 21 was unveiled. And at that conference, he said, quote, current lifestyles and consumption patterns of the affluent middle class, everyone in this room, that involves high meat intake, use of fossil fuels, appliances, refrigeration, home and work air conditioning, it's tough if, gonna, if you live in Arizona, things could get, could get hot, and suburban housing, single-family housing, are all unsustainable. This book describes what else is unsustainable, and the list is very long indeed, but it includes private property, golf courses and ski lodges, irrigation and commercial agriculture, monotheism, and the family unit are all not sustainable. <laughs> That can sound funny until you pick up tomorrow's newspaper and you can find evidence of, evidence of those movements every day. The general categories for Agenda 21 break into three. One is global land use policy, the second is global education policy, and the third is population control and reduction. The United Nations has made it quite clear their view on private property in 1976 at the um, Habitat One conference, it was reported, quote, that private land ownership is also a principal instrument of accumulation and concentration of wealth, and therefore contributes to social injustice. Public control of land use is therefore indispensable. The land use program of sustainable development breaks into two general categories. The first is the Wildlands Project. The Wildlands Project is the elimination of human presence over, over, on over more than 50% of the American landscape and heavily controlled activities on most of the rest of American land. In 1994, the working papers of the Department of Interior, Interior Bureau of Land Management reported, quote, all ecosystem management activities should consider human beings as biological resources. This is a map of the Wildlands Project, a simulated map prepared by a man named Dr. Michael Kaufman. He obtained the information he needed for this map in 1994 from UN offices in Geneva, somewhat clandestinely, I might add. The map was presented to the United States Senate days before the treaty that resulted from this document was to be passed by the U.S. Treaty and by the U.S. Senate in 1994. Because of this map, the treaty didn't come to vote. But its programs have been implemented, have been in the course of implementation ever since. Let me explain the map. The red spots are the wildlands areas, the areas where human use, recreation, and living is to be eliminated. The yellow or orange areas are the, area, are the buffer zones for tight controlled regulation. The black dots are the areas of human settlement 
or smart growth. You know, we see evidence regularly of the implementation of the Wildlands Project, from the road closing programs to the dam bustings, Hetch Hetchy in California, which waters all of San Francisco, is being talked about uh, destruction. Uh, the, the two United States senators from California are both indicating favor for that. Our forest fuel levels have risen dramatically under mandated uh, land management practices and have led to the catastrophic fires throughout the West that are pushing people off rural lands. Resource extraction is always an issue. It's been made a crisis. Shortage of resources and consolidation of land management uh, and land ownership is occurring at a very rapid pace. The Nature Conservancy is a chief beneficiary of that. Habitat set-asides, conservation easements, and compliant partnering have resulted in a loss of private management of rural lands. Private management, the essence of private property, the ability to use and determine uh, management styles is, um, is under great attack. And the root of all of this, of course, is the Endangered Species Act, where for private landowners in rural areas, the worst fears have come true as plants, bugs, and animals have been put above people. The Wildlands Project will not stop until the Endangered Species Act is repealed. The second land use policy of the, um, of the um, uh, uh, sustainable development is a so-called smart growth, which is dense human settlements with increasing controls on how we live and increasing regulation on our mobility. The new mobility, funded with massive amounts of federal dollars, is for trails and rails. Highway programs now have tremendous amounts of their dollars dedicated to this new form of transportation. We like to call it Peking style. <laughs> and these rail lines are being placed along dense government controlled real estate development. In Santa Cruz County, the federal government has approved $300 million for the first 3,000 Stackman Packham residential units along rail lines. Now these units will have Oftentimes, water masters controlling how much water you can use, electric masters doing the same thing. Even some projects require owners or renters to contract that they will not own a car. Compliant government partners or sustainable developers do the business. You cannot build a free enterprise housing project in Santa Cruz County or in any place, uh, many places in California and across the country. You've got to be a nonprofit or you've got to agree to build government styled housing with the controls that are imposing if you're going to get a permit at all. It does mark the end of free enterprise, end of private action. Agenda 21 is the global blueprint for a new order. So you say, well, how can they implement this? Well, the answer is, and I won't go into this very deeply, but what is being developed across this country from, from on, and on behalf and, and by virtue of the efforts of what I call sustainable mercenaries is a system of state-sponsored Soviets. It is the system Al Gore dubbed in the mid-90s the reinvention of government. In order to market that, all kinds of warm and fuzzy terms have been uh, uh, introduced into the lexicon of the American public. Terms that, from a sustainable development perspective, mean nothing what a dictionary would define them to be. Consensus is the process of creating these little Soviets where minority reports aren't allowed, and if you don't go along with the crowd, you're simply dismissed from the consensus process. It's happened to me a number of times. <laughs> the simple word action today means A is for Agenda 21, C is for community, T for teamwork, in operation now. So if you've got action, uh, uh, action councils being formed in your community, know that they're being funded and are being directed in accordance with the Agenda 21 blueprint or have some, at least some high level of suspicion. Protect, preserve, quality of life are, are terms you see often. 
sanctuary. Oh, in Santa Cruz, we have the Monterey Bay Sanctuary. It's 26 miles between Monterey and Santa Cruz, the bay that uh, we live on. But the sanctuary extends 300 miles along the California coast. It is given reason now you can't catch a salmon fish any longer. I mean, salmon fish are all over. But we've got a sanctuary that must be preserved. The fishermen are being wiped out. But it's not just the ocean waters that are covered by the sanctuary. Everything that drains into the sanctuary, over 7,000 square miles, is now subject to 25 federal, state, and local enforcement agencies as regulations and rules are rolled out month by month, again, by the reinvention of government, unelected councils with self-appointed people exercising this kind of control. Watershed is the new, forget about your political boundaries, we're being rearranged now on the basis of watersheds. Facilitators, trained, paid people who know how to engage group manipulation to a predetermined outcome. Best management practice is the idea of the reauthorized Endangered Species Act where some federal agent tells you, well, you, you can't walk in your property during the wintertime because there might be a long-toed salamander mating. Endangered species are now going to be joined by federal, in federal legislation by invasive species le legislation. Restoration, common good, collaborative. Stakeholders, one of my favorite. Well, what stakeholder interest do you represent? Stakeholders are about driving a stake through the heart of private property. International baccalaureate. If your high school doesn't have an international baccalaureate program, consider yourself lucky, but get prepared because it's going to come to your schools too. School to work, huh? That's why, we, that's why we raise our children, so they can become workers. Historic preservation. Vision is one of their favorite terms. They have but one vision, and that is to upset the vision of America's purpose. Here's a couple of the apex councils I'll mention briefly in this reinvention of government idea. ICLE is the International Council for Local Environmental Initiatives. It's a UN NGO based for this uh, continent in Canada. Many, many hundreds if not thousands of communities are now in contract with ICLE to provide the tool chest for bringing sustainable development to a locality. Another apex council are our own federal agencies. This is the United States Department of Agriculture. This is their website. We didn't make this up. But you can see clearly that they have a firm commitment to the United Nations Sustainable Development Program. What that means is that far farmers are under great threat. The American Farm Bureau an accredited United Nations NGO, has not warned the farmers. You say, well, why isn't, uh, why isn't rural America standing up and fighting back? It's because their associations are part of the problem. As Steve says, the entire mess is slipping under the radar, but they are moving fast. Our justice system is also under attack. Most Americans know about the Kelo decision from last summer. But three weeks before Kelo, in a unanimous decision, the court made an even more egregious decision. It's called Lingle versus Chevron, a case out of Hawaii, which held that Fifth Amendment due process requirements do not apply to Fifth Amendment takings cases. Kelo is just the start of this process, the tip of the iceberg, if you will. Because what we're doing is we're switching our philosophy of rights. The Declaration of Independence held that the purpose of government was to protect the natural and unalienable rights of the individual. That all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. But the Declaration of Human Rights controls the individual for the greater good of the community. And in Article 29, Section 3 of that document, it says, the rights and freedoms may be in no case exercised contrary to the principles and purposes of the United Nations. Well, I'll suggest to you that beginning with our Supreme Court and certainly extending to the California courts and most state courts around this country that we're seeing this shift in process. It's a planned evolution run by change agents engaged in action programs. 
The evolution is from self-governance to global collectivism. The self-governance that is being evolved out is a system of liberty based upon the inalienable right to one's life, liberty, and property. What, it, what, what is being replaced is a system of tyranny based on human rights. I mean, human rights, animal rights, they're all the same thing. Man grants them, restricts them, and withdraws them. It's based upon the three E's of equity, economy, and environment. All branches of the federal government have been, for a good while, fully committed to the ideas of Agenda 21, Sustainable Development. Two years ago, President Bush said the United States of America is committed to the United Nations, and we show that commitment by working to fulfill the UN's stated purposes while giving meaning to its ideals. Political globalists are committed to an end process of state capitalism. The assault on private land and natural resources is accelerating. And Henry Lamb is going to talk more about that subject. The growth of public-private partnerships and the growing war on free enterprise is an essential ingredient of Agenda 21, and Steve Yates is going to talk on that. But other Agenda 21 policies include human health care, which involves the surrender of individuality to sustainability. The ultimate question under a world of sustainable development principles is this. Are you sustainable? BP Petroleum now runs its ads. What's the size of your carbon footprint? We are embedding a system of comprehensive planning, much more sophisticated than, than the Chinese cultural plans were, in an effort to reinvent the American government. We are redefining Christianity and moving toward a global religion. Central control of education is building global citizens and human drones. And if you can't appreciate that, check out the work of Michael Chapman at EdWatch, who's done a remarkable job of showing how the decade of sustainable education, which began last year, is in full force in American schools across the country already. It is a political globalist trade policy, managed trade without national boundaries. And it is a system that will play heavily off monetary uncertainty in the years to come. In concluding, I want to make a brief illustration of how sustainable development has been effective at, at attracting the right and the left into a common program. You see, certain right-wingers have been attracted by the idea of insider opportunity through bu bu public-private partnership. But on the left, we've got the social justice advocates and the environmentalists. And when you take those three features, their three E's, and combine them together, you end up with sustainable development, which is a government-controlled society. So it's the forces and the insiders doing the smart growth development with the environmentalists getting their way with the Wildlands Project that deliver us Agenda 21, a regional system of governmental control, which is collectivism and designed to put us under the confines of the United Nations Charter. But there's even more to it. Because the global tyranny that results involves child indoctrination. And if you don't think children in schools are being indoctrinated heavier and heavier every year that passes by, then you simply aren't paying attention to your schools. Globalist trade policy. The junk science, deceit, and corruption that's pr primarily e evident in the environmental movement is why I call the environmental movement a fraud. They don't succeed. Their goals make no sense. Their purpose is the elimination of private property. 
war without declaration plays a huge role in pursuing the kind of permanent revolution that's either coming about or that is already here. And of course, all of that leads us to a police state, a global police state. Now, this is an audience that doesn't need to hear much about liberty, but sustainable development has to be contrasted with something, and what it contrasts with is liberty. You know, liberty is, uh, uh, presumes that the government's power be strictly limited in scope and that the law be applied equally to each person. Freedom means that each of us act on our own authority, limited by our legal responsibility not to infringe on the equal rights of another and the moral and social responsibility to respect the dignity of others. Freedom allows us to raise children with conscience. The state can't do that. And a child raised with conscience is a child prepared to engage in a world where they freely express and productively uh, engage in associations that lead to trade of mutual benefit. And that, coupled with free enterprise, provides genuine peace. Peace can really only exist in free societies, regardless of what the United Nations says their mission is. Because only truly voluntary and not compliant action can govern a peaceful civil society. Peace through individual liberty, a commitment to the ideals of private property, is what brings us the abundance and prosperity that America could be, continue to enjoy in the 21st century. But only if we make a conscious decision between liberty or sustainable development. There is no center ground. There is no compromise. But before we can reject sustainable development, we've got to know what it is. So my, I would implore with all of you, writers, to begin to understand, study sustainable development. It is an exercise in all it is that you know. It's the practical application of it. And the dissemination of that information is what America depends upon if it is to survive through the 21st century. This is the greatest challenge America has ever faced because it is the most insidious and grandest threat we've ever faced. The technology that sits at the hands of the government today when the philosophy of sustainable development takes full root will create a tyranny that will be long lasting. I want to thank you for having us uh, address you today. And Our next speaker will be Mr. Henry Lamb, and he'll be, you'll be speaking for us from there. I don't know if my volume is turned up. Can you hear me? Well, I need to tell you at the outset that I have a breathing problem, so I'm not going to be able to inspire you with my oratory, so I'll just try to share some facts and observations that I've made over the last 20 years or so. Now, in the event that... Uh, I get excited and run out of steam, I may just need to stop and take a breath or two, and don't let that make you uncomfortable because it's making me more comfortable. But just in case I run totally out of steam, I want to call your attention to a magazine that our organization publishes, because everything I'm going to say is covered in this particular issue and documented pretty extensively. It's on a table out here somewhere that you can pick up a copy. What I'd like to do is sort of reinforce much of what Michael has said, maybe fill in some gaps, and raise some questions that I hope you will ask if we have a Q&A at the end. How do you suppose a document like this gets developed? 300 pages, 40 chapters, covering virtually every facet of human existence. It's not some genius sitting over there in Geneva. You know, this says this is how the world ought to live. Put together over a period of about 12 years through an organization, a non-government organization, called the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, IUCN. 
You ever heard of it? Whew. And you guys are the scholars. <laughs> IUCN is headquartered in Geneva, in the same building that, uh, that the UN occupies, in the same building, in one of the buildings that the UN occupies, but in the same building with the World Wildlife Fund, which was, which was created by the IUCN in 1961. The IUCN, along with the World Wildlife Fund, <coughs> the World Resources Institute, are the three non-government organizations that virtually dominate international policy, especially as it relates to the environment and social services. They developed the Convention on Biological Diversity. They developed the Convention on Climate Change. They developed Agenda 21 and had it rubber stamped by the official delegates to these various UN meetings. You probably are not aware that six of our federal agencies are paid members to the IUCN with membership fees in excess of $50,000 a year. Department of Interior, Department of Commerce, Department of Agriculture, State Department, NOAA, <laughs> Fish and Wildlife Service. And these bureaucrats assemble in various places around the world, write up these bizarre ideas, give them to the United Nations Environment Program, who rubber stamps them with the ministers and delegates from the nations who attend these things, bring it home and it becomes either international law through a treaty or international policy through a soft law, non-binding document like Agenda 21. That's what happened here with Agenda 21 in 1992. In Rio, <coughs> in Rio, George Bush was president, just on his way out, Bush won. He did sign Agenda 21. He did sign the Convention on Climate Change. He refused to sign the Convention on Biological Diversity. And he was bitterly ridiculed by then administrator of the EPA, Bill Riley, and one Al Gore, who was uh, about to become vice president. Before the 92 thing happened, <coughs> You need to go back to the 76 conference that Michael mentioned. The United Nations Conference on Human Settlements in Vancouver, British Columbia, 1976. This is where the first policy on land use was adopted by a UN agency. Interesting that the delegates from the United States to this conference included a couple of people whose names you may recall. Carla Hill, chief trade negotiator in the Bush administration, Bush won. <coughs> also chief trade negotiator in the Uruguay round of GATT that produced the World Trade Organization. She signed that 1976 document along with her signature, officially representing the United States, was one William K. Riley, who at the time was chairman of the Conservation Fund, funded by the Rockefeller Brothers. Mr. Riley's work with the Conservation Fund was primarily during the 70s, the creation of three publications. One was called the Use of Land, a Citizen's Policy Guide to Urban Growth. Another was called the Unfinished Agenda. In these documents developed by Bill Riley, 
were the recommendations that were included in the Land Use Policy and Planning Act that was pushed by Udall in the 70s. Some of you whose hair is as gray as mine may remember the initiative in the 70s to create comprehensive land use planning at the federal level. And that created a backlash called the Sagebrush Rebellion. And that legislation was defeated. But that didn't stop the proponents of comprehensive land use planning. Mr. Riley produced a third publication called The Blueprint for the Environment. And he gave that to George Bush on November 30th, 1988. 1,500 pages, 730 recommendations, for which Mr. Bush appointed him administrator of the EPA. And at the end of that term, he wound up in Rio holding hands with Al Gore, criticizing George Bush for not signing the Convention on Biological Diversity. Uh, let me go just a little bit further with this document in 1976. Um, Michael gave you uh, a quote from that document about uh, private property causing, uh, what was it, Michael? <laughs> Let me read you the exact quote from the preamble to this document. It says, land cannot be treated as an ordinary asset controlled by individuals and subject to the pressures and inefficiencies of the market. <laughs> I thought you'd get a kick out of that. <laughs> <laughs> Private land ownership is also a principal instrument of accumulation and concentration of wealth and therefore contributes to social injustice. And if unchecked, it may become a major obstacle in the planning and implementation of development schemes. The provision of decent dwellings and healthy conditions for the people can only be achieved if land is used in the interest of a society as a whole. Public control of land use is therefore indispensable. And the U.S., I couldn't believe it when I read this. The United States of America sent delegates to the to this conference, who signed this thing in behalf of me. That boiled my water. <laughs> Let me go on a little bit further. This is just a preamble. One of the recommendations, it says, at recommendation A1, all countries should establish as a matter of urgency a national policy on human settlements embodying the distribution of population. Such a policy should be devised to facilitate population redistribution according to the availability of resources. Public ownership of or effective control of land in the public interest is the single most important <coughs> means of achieving a more equitable distribution of the benefits of development whilst assuring environmental, environmental impacts are considered. And it gets worse. I hope by now you recognize that the fundamental conflict is that sustainable development is built on the assumption that government has the inherent power to dictate and manage the affairs of its citizens. I read in another piece of paper that the just power of government arises from the consent of the governed. 180 degrees apart philosophically. These concepts are colliding in the arena of public policy. And as Michael has told you, the people who subscribe to the Jeffersonian, John Lockean philosophy are losing. Not because our arguments are fallible, but because we who believe this Lockean, Jeffersonian philosophy are sitting on our butts watching 
ball games and you know doing whatever else we do and are unaware that the people who promote this Hobbesian philosophy are out there working their tails off. Hit me on the shoulder whenever you want me to stop. <laughs> You're doing great. That was the report of the United Nations Conference on Human Settlements, which met in July of 1976 in Vancouver. And the, it, it's documented in this. If you get a copy of this, you have a complete resource. This gets us back to the 1992 conference. This maybe gives you a little background about why this Agenda 21 came out in uh, 1992. One of the recommendations in this thing, in chapter 37, says, each country should complete as soon as practicable a review of capacity and capacity building for requiring, for the requirements for devising a national sustainable development strategy, including a program to implement its own Agenda 21 action plan. Well, Bill Clinton couldn't wait to comply with that recommendation. Even though it is a non-binding uh, document, as Michael said, that executive order created the President's Council on Sustainable Development. Uh, in addition to Ken Lay and uh, a couple of industry representatives, this council also included the Sierra Club and the Nature Conservancy and 25 cabinet secretaries. I had the duty, <laughs> what a pleasure, I had the duty to attend uh, the president's, the PCSD meeting, the 11th meeting as it were, in DC, at which I heard uh, Ron Brown, who was Secretary of Commerce at the time, stand up and say, my department has analyzed Agenda 21, and we can implement 67% of the recommendations administratively, administratively, through the rulemaking process, without going to Congress. So did most of the other secretaries reported similar results from their re-evaluation, their analysis of Agenda 21. And they began implementing Agenda 21 administratively. As Michael mentioned, Mr. Gore's appointment was to reinvent government. And Mr. Gore, in his reinvention of the Department of Interior and the EPA, created the Ecosystem Management Policy, which, if you have ever reviewed, you can read this and read Agenda 21 and see that the Ecosystem Management Policy implements the recommendations in Agenda 21. And the most significant thing that it did was to change the priority of ecosystem protection to the same level of priority as human health. In fact, the documents say just that. I wasn't too happy about that either. But then again, he didn't ask me, even though I, was, I am from Tennessee. The ecosystem management policy, the goal is to implement the Wildlands Project. How many of you had ever heard of the Wildlands Project before Michael mentioned it? One, two, three, four, five. Congratulations. Praise the Lord and pass the ammunition. Everybody else listen up. It's exceedingly important. When I first read the Wildlands Project in uh, 1992, I really laughed 
<laughs> like Michael. <laughs> These are kooks. It will never happen. Let me read you just a little bit. <clears throat> Come from page 21 of the Wildlands Project. That at least half of the land area of the 48 contaminated states should be encompassed in core reserves and inner corridor zones within the next few decades. Nonetheless, half of the region and wilderness is a reasonable guess of what it will take to restore viable populations of large carnivores and the natural disturbance regimes, assuming that most of the other 50% is managed intelligently as buffer zones. Eventually, <coughs> a wilderness network would dominate a region, with human habitations being the islands. The native ecosystem, listen to this, the native ecosystem and the collective needs of non-human species must take precedence over the needs and desires of humans. Pitiful. To make this happen, there has to be an initiative to redistribute the population according to the goals of that 1976 document. There's a process called restoration and rehabilitation. Sounds very productive, very positive, very warm and fuzzy. <coughs> what it means is, if you live in a rural area that we want to make a buffer zone, get your butt out. And if you don't do it voluntarily, we will impose a critical habitat under the authority of the ESA. Or we will declare a wetlands under the Clean Water Act of 1972, which doesn't contain the word wetland, and force you not to be able to use your land. And I don't care where you go in the West, you see people have been moved from their land. They are being forced off their land here. Just recently, <laughs> Bow Water decided it wanted to sell 100,000 acres in Cumberland Plateau in Tennessee. Immediately, the people who are promoting the Wildlands Project through the Southern Appalachian Biosphere Reserve, of which we are a part at this moment, came along with the idea that the state should buy that 100,000 acres because it is a biogem and should be added to the core wilderness area of the Southern Appalachian Biosphere Reserve. How many of you know that you're sitting in the middle of the Southern Appalachian Biosphere Reserve, designated by the United Nations in 1979. You are. That Biosphere Reserve stretches from Birmingham to Roanoke, from Asheville to Nashville. Management of that area is, I won't say governed, but it is, it follows the management recommendations set forth in the Seville Strategy and the framework statutes for managing biosphere reserves. I didn't intend to chase that rabbit, so I'll quit. I got one other thing to say. These islands of human habitat that everybody has been talking about, they are the sustainable communities. Those sustainable communities are the result of the Department of Commerce, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, giving the American Planning Association $5 million to develop a publication called Smart Growth, Legislative Guidebook for a Managing Society, for Planning a, for planning a Society. That book contains model legislation that is being adopted by state legislatures with funding incentives from the federal government, which writes into law through <coughs> comprehensive planning acts the requirement to impose the recommendations in Agenda 21. Now, I'm going to shut up, and if we have question and answer period, maybe uh, you'll have some questions that we can get into. But I hope I've left you enough time.
title, and while preparing this thing, my title tended to hop around like a frog on a hot sidewalk. Public-private partnerships, the undermining of free enterprise, and the emergence of soft fascism. Over the past decade, the expression public-private partnership has crept into our public lexicon. In this paper, we shall examine what precisely is a public-private partnership. What, on the other hand, is free enterprise? Are the two compatible? In answering these questions, we shall see that although advocates of public-private partnerships frequently speak the language of economic development, the results amount to economic control. For public-private partnerships are just one of the key components of the collectivist <coughs> edifice, edifice being built up around the idea of sustainable development. Within the economic arena of that environment is the emergence of what we might call soft fascism, a system that fits the dictionary definitions of fascism but whose totalitarian effects will be felt primarily by those who wish to walk their own paths in life rather than walk the paths the sustainable developers are in the process of laying down. Advocates of public-private partnerships paint a warm and fuzzy picture of them as free market friendly. From one of the main websites devoted to them comes the following from a white paper published by the National Council for Public-Private <coughs> Partnerships, one of the leading advocacy organizations, an, an NGO by the way. Public-private partnerships are a means of utilizing private sector resources in a way that is a blend of outsourcing and privatization. PPPs can involve the design, construction, financing, operation, and maintenance of public infrastructure or facilities or the operation of services to meet public needs. And in a follow-up, PPPs are contractual arrangements under which the public and private sectors join together in a partnership to utilize the best skills and capacities of each to better serve the public. Public-private partnerships are formed to meet an objective that any constituency would want to provide the highest quality service at the most optimal cost to the public. So warm and fuzzy, free market friendly sounding. In other words, according to their advocates, public-private partnerships use the financial resources of business, the private sector, to carry out activities or functions government, the public sector, has assumed for itself. Implied in the defense of public-private partnerships is the recognition that private enterprise is more efficient than government. As one quoted expert put it in arguing for the necessity of public-private partnerships, counties, states, provinces, and communities have hit the tax wall, meaning they have no more room to raise taxes. Doing so would either violate some constitutional or statutory limit, to which they pay lip service, or send people and businesses packing for friendlier climes. In other cases, government has simply not kept pace with technology and productiv productivity advances and must rely upon private enterprise to put its unique expertise to work. End of quote. Expertise. <laughs> expertise. There are now thousands of public-private partnerships in place throughout the country. Every city, every town, every county, every community. Engaging in activities ranging from building roads and neighborhoods to providing water and wastewater services to renovating government schools, no, I don't call them public schools, <laughs> to overseeing the management of real estate, to providing health care, this number seems destined to grow in the immediate future. It is fair to say that public-private partnerships have been accepted without question by the mainstream of both government and business. We have seen very gradually over three decades the emergence of a new paradigm for the relationship between the two. This paradigm, of course, is that of sustainable development. Sustainable development combines the power of the purse one might call it with the power of the sword. The resources of business, the power of the purse, 
are utilized to do the work of governance, the power of the sword, with the former's full cooperation and support. The reports we cited noted several examples of what appear to be, to all intents and purposes, successful public-private partnerships. Successful, that is, in achieving the ends wanted within the bureaucracy. Expansionist or interventionist government, the idea that government should undertake responsibility for managing huge portions of a country's economy and infrastructure is taken for granted. But limits on the capacity to, of government to effect change by itself are acknowledged. The solution to the problem of the limits on the capacity of government in the new paradigm is to employ the resources of business in a way that brings business fully on board and enlists it as a collaborator or partner. Of course, the larger the business, the better, because bigger businesses tend to have deeper pockets than smaller businesses. Rocket Science 101. The critics of public-private partnerships, usually cited in the favorable literature, are not those who do not trust government, but those who do not trust business. Big surprise. The latter see private sector involvement as, in the words of one critic, a plot to establish a completely free market with overtones of dog-eat-dog, -dog, survival of the fittest, and culling of the weakest. To our minds, of course, far more serious allegations can be mounted not just against public-private partnerships, but against the paradigm in which they are at home. But first we must do more historical detective work and identify more of the major behind-the-scenes players. How did this enthusiasm for public-private partnerships begin? If we wish to begin at the beginning, we would have to begin with the idea of the comprehensive planned society. That would take us all the way to the ancient Greek philosopher Plato, who envisioned utopia in his republic, ruled by philosopher kings, as he called them. In the republic, there is a place for everyone, and everyone knows his place. In modern times, we could cite the collectivism of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who invented the idea of a general will through which the individual could be forced to be free. And we could cite G.W.F. Hegel, inventor of the idea of the state as the historical manifestation of the absolute, whatever that means, <laughs> with the idea that the individual belongs to the state. That's how it works in practice. As methodologists, we would also have to cite those Fabian socialists who formed in the late 1800s and whose watchword was gradualism. We will say more about the Fabians below. Characteristic of all these visions is that the individual person does not own himself. He exists to serve the state or the collective. He is not to be allowed to direct his own paths, but is compelled down paths laid by those in power or their underlings. There have been a few incisive critiques of central planning of whatever sort, such as those of Mises, Hayek, and others. But collectivists have never allowed intellectual criticism to stand in their way. The sustainable development paradigm is a paradigm of comprehensive collectivist planning, supposedly to safeguard the environment, as we have already seen from Michael Shaw's presentation and Henry Lamb's. The long-term goal here is what can be increasingly envisioned as an emerging world state with many facets. The three E's of sustainable development, equity, economy, environment, and a prospective fourth E, as I like to call it, education. There's a thing here, edu somewhere down there, education for sustainable development, how it's taken over the government schools. This world state will gradually subsume and eradicate nation states until the phrase United States of America names not a sovereign nation but a large tract of micromanaged real estate, much of which is, well, we've seen from the Wildlands Project, will be off limits to human beings. During the 1970s, with the growing realization that overtly socialist planning was failing on a massive scale, the United Nations gradually turned its attention to the environment. Its advocates picked up on such notions as the limits to growth 
promulgated by elite groups such as the Club of Rome. The UN established the Brundtland Commission in 1983 to study the problem further. In 1987, this commission released the report, it's right here, Our Common Future. And that defined sustainable development as, and to quote, development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. How are they going to know what the needs of future generations are? Could the generation that existed a hundred years ago have any idea what our needs might be? It's silly, <laughs> but anyway. This definition presumes that we can know the needs of future generations with sufficient specificity to act effectively. At a deeper level, it presumes that economic development cannot be left to the free choices of acting persons, but must be managed, that is, controlled through governance. This continued call for the centralization of economic development along with all resources, human as well as natural, provided the UN with the perfect incentive to assume more and more of a role as emerging, supervening megastate. That way it could police the centralization process in the name of protecting the environment and safeguarding future generations. Other components of the new paradigm, in the late 1970s, a British scientist, James Lovelock, developed the so-called Gaia Hypothesis, a renovated version of the old pagan faith in Gaia, Mother Earth. The idea came to, this idea came to the attention of Prince Charles of Wales. Charles had already become preoccupied with environmentalism, and because of who he was, doors opened to him. When he spoke, people listened, especially people with very deep pockets. Prince Charles went on to create the Prince of Wales International Business Leaders Forum, which promoted the concept of sustainable development within the multinational corporation orbit. The new organization held its first meeting in Charleston, South Carolina in 1990, and that provided a major connecting link that brought international business on board with the United Nations Development Program and the World Bank. Agenda 21, though, was arguably the Bible of the Sustainable Development Movement. And that was unveiled two years later at the Rio Summit in Rio de Janeiro. It's an immense, comprehensive document with chapters involving business and other non-governmental and, and non organizations, including huge foundations, nonprofits, <coughs> and sometimes extremely wealthy individuals into the promotion of sustainable development. To quote from chapter 30, governments, business, and industry, including transnational corporations, should strengthen partnerships to implement the principles and criteria for sustainable development. Governments should identify and implement an appropriate mix of economic instruments and normative measures such as laws, legislations, and standards in consultation with business and industry including transnational corporations that will promote the use of cleaner production with special consideration for small and medium-sized enterprises. Voluntary private initiatives should also be encouraged. How nice of them. And then further on, large business and industry, including transnational corporations, should consider establishing partnership schemes with small and medium-sized enterprises to help facilitate the exchange of experience and managerial skills, market development, and technological know-how where appropriate with the assistance of international organizations. Business and industry should establish national councils for sustainable development. 1993, new, newly inaugurated President Bill Clinton formed the President's Council on Sustainable Development. That same year, a milestone saw the creation of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, which Michael discussed. The phrase public-private partnership was used 1996 at the United Nations Conference on Human Settlements, Habitat II, held in Istanbul. Dr. Wally Indow, Secretary General of that conference, told businesswoman and author Joan Vion, I quote, we have got to a point where we cannot not partner with the private sector. 
as governments, as the civil society, as NGOs, but also as people active in international development such as the UN." End of quote. In the 1990s, the so-called economic boom overshadowed and diverted attention from the fact that our economic system was being gradually bent in the direction the sustainable developers wanted it to go. This was the era of reinventing government, which was portrayed as a de-evolution of power to the local level, which was where the sustainable developers preferred to work in stealth under the radar screen. It was easy once a sufficient number of corporate players in each locale were on board. By the start of the 2000 decade, one city or town after another all across the country was bringing in consultants and having visioning sessions. Communities began to be transformed from within, typically with the full cooperation of mayors and other elected officials, other local government officials, business groups such as the local chambers of commerce, presidents of local colleges, and many neighborhood association groups. Plans with names such as Vision 2025, used in Greenville, South Carolina, and also interestingly in Tulsa, Oklahoma, would result from these sessions. Few residents have seen the edifice of controls gradually being built around them as offshoots of sustainable developments such as the new urbanism have taken root. Most, as this writer can attest from personal experience, have not even heard the term sustainable development, but they see partnering as a good idea. Thus, such movements employ part, uh, pro, public private partnerships to create centers of activity with as much as possible in them large and small businesses of all varieties, apartments, condominiums, schools, etc., very close proximity to one another, pack them in like sardines. The new urbanism promotes itself as creating communities centered around convenience. Those living and working in them are able to walk or sometimes bicycle everywhere to work, to buy groceries, to attend classes, and so on. These centers of activity are often very automobile unfriendly with narrow crooked streets and an absence of adequate parking. Automobiles, of course, are unsustainable. Gradually is a key word in the start of the last paragraph. Those who have wished to transform entire societies learned two lessons some time ago. The first is that if they, work pro if they proceed slowly and work piecemeal, they can accomplish more than if they attempt to foment violent revolution. The Fabian socialists adopted gradualism as a pragmatic alternative to revolutionary agitation when they formed in Great Britain in 1883. They took their name from Quintus Fabius Maximus, the Roman general noted for his delaying tactics against an enemy. Their description of what they intended to do, penetrate and permeate. They founded very few institutions of their own, although the London School of Economics is an exception. They preferred to transform existing ones from within. Eventually, they became, the Fabians that is, became the dominant presence in the British Labor Party. Tony Blair is a member of the Fabian Society, which still exists. The influence of Fabian socialism in the United States should not be underestimated. The Wilson administration was permeated with Fabian socialists and their associates. The Fabians had realized early that Americans would not warm to the term socialism. So they stopped using it and used term names like League for Industrial Democracy, chaired by John Dewey of progressive education fame. John Maynard Keynes was also a Fabian socialist. There can be no doubt that Fabian gradualism influenced the development of the environmentalist movement in the United States. Fabians and large foundations such as Ford help sponsor and bankroll it. This brings us to the second lesson. Pure socialism was proving unworkable, as we said. It could not produce. Capitalism, however, could produce. It made sense to allow capitalism to develop and to exploit its transformative potential via the Schumpeterian concept of creative destruction. 
It is thus arguable that Fabian socialism actually penetrated the direction business itself took, especially in the 1980s with the creation of, say, enterprise zones. Capitalism allowed and even encouraged, but carefully managed. As our economy seemed to improve for a while during that period, few noticed the collectivism that permeated the thinking of the mainstream, although we hear catchy phrases like, there's no I in team. Education had become entirely and explicitly group-focused so that the business persons turned out would have no moral center other than the collectivist one. It became increasingly vocation-focused. Its products would, easily, would be easily sold on the environmentalist agenda through arguments ranging from supposed rights of future generations to allegations of global climate change. With an impoverished educational background, younger generations were vulnerable to what the sustainable developers wanted. This offers the best ex explanation of how businesses, large and small, were persuaded to get behind an agenda one would otherwise think they would repudiate as contrary to their best interests. Arguably, the edifice of regulations contributed massively to driving business overseas, taking our job base with it, when keeping jobs in America simply became too expensive. And there are a multitude of examples of public-private partnerships, transportation, education, and in the interest of time, I'm not going to read those examples, but I believe Henry will be publishing a version of this paper in a future issue of, of um, his journal there. Uh, let me just read this. Education for the next generation of the world's growing young population is an urgent priority not only for governments around the world, but also for all society. For the private sector in particular, an effective education system is critical for economic growth and development in building a skilled labor force increasing the purchasing power of citizens and improving productivity. Education goals such as equity, access, and reducing gender disparity coupled with issues such as poverty and hunger that are prevalent in many developing nations pose a complex development challenge that demands a bold new paradigm. This paradigm is based on collaborative public-private partnerships that leverage the key strengths of all of society's stakeholders, there's that word again, such as the global and local public and private sectors and community based on civil society. Now that's from a document called the Global Education Initiative. All this has a pleasant futuristic ring to it, but as a prospective model for the education of the next generation, consider what's not mentioned, personal finance for example. Increasing the pers purchasing power of citizens without also teaching them personal finance and money management from their youngest ages as a recipe for a citizenry saddled with debt, which is essentially what we have today. Also not mentioned are mathematics, logic, history, basic government, basic economics, or even basic literacy. Or school to work education, which Michael mentioned emphasizes vocation at the expense of traditional subject areas and so exceeds exceedingly well into the new um, paradigm. And vocationalism in education makes perfect sense if one's goals are social engineering. Public-private partnerships are fundamentally different from previous organizations and collaborations. Their goals are also different while having adopted the language of markets and seeming at times to further markets and economic development as ends in themselves, their widespread adoption is bringing about a form of governance that is alien to the founding principles of the United States. Constitutionally limited government, government by consent of the governed, and inimicable to individual liberty. We have begun to see government not by consent of the governed, but governance control by committee and by bureaucracy. This brand of governance employs an arsenal of tricks imported from behavioral psychology, such as the use of Delphi technique, to coerce a, co a consensus by intimidating and marginalizing critics. 
I think all three of us have had that experience at one time or another. It has no problem using Hegelian dialectic to achieve desired results in a city or town. Hegelian dialectic in this context involves the triad of crisis, reaction, response. Manufacture a crisis, such as allowing levels of development in certain areas of a city result to result in intolerable levels of traffic congestion. This yields a predictable reaction as members of the public demand that the city or county or both do something. They adopt smart growth, the response, which was wanted by the sustainable developers all along. And when these techniques fail, they will, as they will occasionally, developers resort to legalized theft if an existing business or even an entire neighborhood is in the way of a desired new urbanist project, that business or neighborhood must go. The neighborhood is declared blighted under local ordinance and eminent domain is, is employed. Arguably, the sustainability agenda has paved the way for the obliteration of private property rights in America. The educational wing of this agenda assures that assures the graduation of citizens who do not know what private property rights are, as they will have been given job skills but no knowledge of such ideas or their historical or philosophical origins. The Supreme Court's horrifying Kelo decision last year set off alarm bells, but should have surprised no one who was following the gradualist progression initiated by the Fabians. This decision permitted the use of eminent domain traditionally reserved for public goods such as the building of a road or a library or a school to be employed for private development. Since last summer we have seen numerous other methods to use or misuse eminent domain to take private property away when it stands in the way of what a private developer often in partnership with a governmental entity wants. It is becoming clear that individuals who stand in the way of this advancing sustainability agenda will be, will be relocated forcibly if necessary. How much time do we have left? <laughs> okay, I have a section here called Free Enterprise Revisited, but I probably don't need to read that to this crowd. <laughs> Uh, Public-private partnerships and homegrown soft fascism. Let me read a quote from Joan Vion, who is a globetrotter in her own right, has been to United Nations meetings and World Economic <coughs> Forum meetings and rubbed noses with the muckety-mucks and come back with a lot of interesting stories to tell, interesting and, and scary. So she writes, a public-private partnership will always have as its goal a business-making venture that requires some form of governance. The question is, since the players will vary in experience and wealth, who has the most power? We know from life itself that whoever has the most money has the power. For example, when a public-private partnership is comprised of governance, governments, such as the County De uh, Department of Environmental Initiatives, the State Department of Environmental Resources, a number of, of private entities, such as a land trust or foundation, and the Nature Conservancy nonprofit, along with a corporation such as Black & Decker, the players with the most money control the partnership. In this case, it would be the Nature Conservancy with assets of over one billion and Black & Decker Corporation with a capitalization of 1.6 billion. Representative government loses. By this method then citizens are deprived of private property rights and control over their lives and business activities. When private corporations must compete on an open market for the best employees and for customers, that is free enterprise capitalism, However, when corporations of various sizes form partnerships with governmental entities of various sizes, or when either one partners with foundations or nonprofit sector entities, or even, I would argue, are legally able to borrow money from banks created according to the fractional reserve system, free enterprise is compromised. 
the economic system begins to move from a value system based on liberty and productivity to one based on control and plunder. Fascism is the name we give to the economic ideology which merges the power of the purse with the power of the sword in order to create policy, impose it by methods ranging from subterfuge to force, and take a society in a desired direction. Uh, to quote, fascism adheres to the philosopher king belief that only one class, which is by birth, education, or social standing, is capable of understanding what is best for the whole community and putting it into practice. This, of course, is the Platonistic ideal mentioned briefly above. Now, since we're out of time, I have to summarize quickly that at the bottom line, that's what it's all about here, is this idea that some folks have, a minority of folks, of, I've started calling them the philosopher kings, that they believe that they're most fit to rule, that there is one group of people, whether by superior intelligence or bloodline or what have you, by their inherent nature, they are most suited to rule over everybody else and the sustainability agenda, sustainable development, has become a remarkably useful tool well, in their hands. And ultimately what this, wa what this group wants is the abolition of all individual freedoms, the abolition of private property rights, the abolition of all nations, and the institution, gradually, of world government, ruled by themselves, of course. And the documentation for this, this sounds like a conspiracy theory, but it's not a theory. It's as much a fact as gravity. It's extremely well documented. And some of the documentation is right up here. But the sustainable development agenda has been an extremely useful tool in the hands of a minority of people, evil men with very deep pockets who believe themselves most fit to rule. Thank you.